Hello and welcome back to our series of teachings on spiritual discernment. Uh, this is the fourth in that series and today we'll be talking about how do we find God's will or God's purpose for our own lives. Uh, I'd like to uh, begin um, by uh, talking about a specific uh, challenge and that is the phrase God's will. Um, Christians often use this and uh, they will say things like, I'm, I'm looking for God's will for my life or um, I don't want to do what I want to do, I want to do what God wants me to do. And, and the understanding there is that God has some predetermined purpose for me. And uh, my job then is to find out what that purpose is and fulfill it. Um, uh, but I, I'm not sure that it works that way and it doesn't uh, feel authentic to me to think that God has one path that God has chosen for us and uh, it's our job to follow that path. And uh, if we misread the signals in our life, uh, we could uh, end up doing something other than what God has uh, determined for us. So I'd like to propose a different kind of understanding, but I'd like to uh, explore that uh, through uh, uh, a recent movie, uh, not so recent now, um, Dead Poet Society. And maybe you've seen that movie. Uh, Robin Williams uh, plays John Keating, uh, an English teacher at a private boarding school for boys. And he's a creative and dynamic teacher, very inventive. And, uh, and he touches these boys that he's teaching and gets them enthused about the arts, about poetry and literature and theater. And one boy in his class, Neil, uh, Neil uh, is particularly motivated by these classes. And, and he uh, gathers the other boys in the class to begin the Dead Poet Society, which is a secret meeting that they hold, a secret gathering where they read poetry to one another. Uh, and he also um, lands a job uh, in the school play. He, he gets the lead role. So Neil has come to life in a new way. He's discovered poetry and beauty and art, and he's discovered himself as an actor, and uh, he dreams of fulfilling that uh, dream of becoming an actor. The problem in the film is that his parents don't uh, approve of his plans, and um, his father in particular um, dismisses his desire to be in a play. The father wants him to be serious about life and, and is hoping that he will go to a school to become a doctor. And so the father has determined that uh, the course that he should follow is the course uh, toward a degree in medicine. And uh, he, he insists that, uh, that Neil quit the play and uh, not do drama. And uh, he's very suspicious of Mr. Keating and, um, and his influence on Neil. So there's a tension between Neil, who wants something and has discovered something about himself, and his father, who wants something different. And the father imposes his will. He's very rigid and hard, and he won't listen or uh, comply with Neil's wishes. The end result is a tragic one where Neil commits suicide in the film. He doesn't know how to work out this tension with his father, and so he ends his life. I think of that movie because I think uh, in, in Neil's parents, we have an example of bad parenting. Um, uh, parents who make a determination about their, their son or daughter and decide uh, what path that child should follow 
I don't think that's good parenting. It puts a lot of pressure on the relationship. And if the desire isn't shared by the son or daughter, um, they either end up compromising and following the parent's path, which often leads to conflict in their own uh, soul, or uh, breaking free from the parents and following their own desires. So uh, a better image of parenting, I think, is, is a parent who has deep desires for the child, but is not uh, making a dis determination about which path they should follow. For example, a good parent might desire that their child grow up and be healthy and uh, join in society in a productive way. They might hope that their child uh, realizes his or her gifts and abilities and find some way to express those gifts and live into them in their life. They might hope that their child uh, finds love and, um, and finds someone to love and finds someone that loves him or her and that uh, perhaps they enter into a relationship and become a family themselves. They might hope that they find meaning in their work life and find something to do that is productive and helpful in society. Um, so they might have all of these desires, but none of them is as tight as saying, I want you to be a doctor or I want you to be a lawyer. I want you to go to this university. I want you to study this. Uh, so there's a kind of fluidity, a, a more openness about their desires. And it seems to me that that is also how God parents us. That God doesn't uh, sit at some control panel in the sky and determine that this person will be uh, commissioned, as it were, and designated to fulfill this particular job or uh, need in the world. I don't think uh, God makes that predetermined judgment and that it's our duty to find out what it is and to follow it, whether we desire that or not for ourselves. I think rather that uh, God has these deep desires for us. God has created us. God has created each of us as a unique individual with interests and likes and uh, skills and talents and a certain temperament and a certain um, uh, tendencies to want to live and work in a certain way. So uh, we're unique creatures and I think that God has a desire for us to discover ourselves and to live into the person that we've been created to be. And I don't think there's just one path that will fit that. I think there are probably multiple paths that each of us could have taken in life and still realized God's purposes for us. So uh, God is a parent that has, I would say, deep yearnings for us as his children. And uh, this is different than having a predetermined will, which we must discover and follow. And I think that gives us some freedom to think uh, God has equipped me with these gifts and talents and abilities, these likes and interests, these uh, personality traits. How can I use those uh, and live into them and claim them and um, uh, find a way to express them in the world that allows me to become the person that God created me to be? So I would set aside that term, God's will, which sounds too determined to me, too set, uh, too specified. Set that aside for the, uh, God's desire or God's yearning. And like a good parent, God yearns for good things for me, but doesn't prescribe one particular path. So if that is true, how are we going to uh, companion with God, work with God to discover our own life's path? And uh, I would say that uh, one of the key places we should look is at our deepest desires. 
Now, many of us as Christians have been taught uh, to be suspicious of our desires, to, uh, to almost assume that if we desire, then it can't be what God desires. And God's desires for us uh, are, are much more difficult or challenging than what we desire, or they're at least different. And uh, so we've been uh, taught not to really give a lot of thought or attention to what we want in life. And there is a way where we can be selfishly preoccupied with our own desires. But I think desires are also a key indicator of how we've been created and of the unique individual that we're meant to be. And these deepest, most authentic desires of our hearts are uh, like God's uh, thumbprint on us. They're what makes us unique and they're part of how God has created us. And so I think desires are something to be attended to and that they are important indicators of what God's call in our life might be about. So I sometimes suggest to people that they just take out a sheet of paper and write down whatever they desire. And you might find it helpful if you were to do this exercise to ask yourself some questions, you know, like say, I've always wanted to, what? Or uh, if I could do anything, uh, I would try to do this. Or if I had the chance, I would try to learn about this, or I would try to explore this. Um, use some of those leading phrases to trigger your thinking and write down everything, anything that comes to mind, even if it seems silly or inappropriate. Huh? Um, just write it down anyway. It's part of who you are. It's come to mind. It reflects something about you. Just put it on the list anyway. And compile a list of your desires. And uh, then once you have had that list, to pause with it, to consider it, and to say, what do these desires that I've specified uh, that are part of me, what do they show me about what's important to me? about what type of person I am, about what I might find fulfilling in life. What do they point me to? Uh, what indications are there of what God's yearning for me might be uh, as an individual with particular gifts? So I, I think uh, exploring our desires is important. And, uh, and yet, as we know, we have different desires and not all of them might be uh, authentic to what we are being called to be or what we desire to be. Uh, we also have uh, conflicting desires in us, um, desires for power or desires for money or desires to possess a person or whatever it is. Um, we, we have things that we're drawn to that we know are not really uh, consonant with God's purposes for us. And so it's a matter of sorting through those desires that we find in our heart and uh, looking for those desires that are most authentic, that is most true to us, true to the person we want to be and true to the person that we believe God wants us to be. And uh, to name those desires and to bring them into the light and see what they show us about what path we might take in life. Not all desires are equal. Uh, some will be more important to us than others. And uh, we might desire to learn a language or something, but it's not as crucial to us as a desire to fulfill a particular type of work in the world. So uh, they vary in importance, they vary in authenticity, and we'll have to do some discernment to see which ones are the most important to pay attention to. So if you'd like to pause the tape and spend some time on this exercise of naming our desires and uh, looking at what they say to us, uh, you can do that now. We'll go on then to talk about some obstacles 
that we face in discerning what uh, God's yearning for us might be, what God's desire for us might be, or what our deepest desires are. I'd like to name three obstacles. And the first obstacle is what I'm calling other voices. We are all bombarded uh, with other voices every day from every angle. Um, just think of the power of the media in our lives, how much we are exposed to advertising uh, in magazines, on television, on computers. There are ads popping up constantly. And the purpose of those ads is to get us to want something or to think that we need this thing or to think that our lives would be better if only we had this thing. That's uh, what advertisers are doing. They're trying to create a hunger, create a need that you will, uh, uh, that will force you to go out and buy their product. So that can be an obstacle because those ads are constantly showing us uh, glimpses of idealized lives and saying, you'd like to look like these people, wouldn't you? You'd like to have fun like these people are having fun. And so uh, to do that, you should buy our product. Um, and uh, we have to recognize that uh, those subtle voices are coming at us all day long uh, from, from the media that is just a part of our lives. And we'll have to see them as as the enticements that they are, and, um, and be very discreet about uh, how we respond to them. We're also subject to other voices. We're subject to the voices of our peers, our friends, uh, people of our own generation who, who have ideas of what's important in life, who have um, beliefs and uh, constructs that they follow in their own lives that they would like to see us follow as well. Um, they uh, might think it's important to make this particular choice or to follow this particular path in life or to find this particular kind of relationship. And they, uh, they pressure us to, to do the same and uh, to follow those same values. So we hear from our peers and they might not be valuing the same things that God values or that we uh, in our deepest, most authentic self value and dream of for ourselves. So we have to be careful about those voices and how they influence us and ask ourselves, is this a voice that feels authentic to me? And is what it's asking of me the right thing? And does it feel authentic and right to me? Um, we also have the voice of our parents. No matter how old we are, we, we have this voice in our head from our parents. And uh, we know what they would expect of us and what they would want for us. Or we at least project that and imagine what they would want for us. And so that's an influence, a strong influence for some people. They don't want to disappoint or hurt their parents. And uh, so they might comply and and conform their life to their parents' wishes. So uh, we have all of these different voices coming at us, uh, plus our own internal voices. Maybe the voice that says, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, you should be more like her, you should be more like him. Uh, those kind of should messages <laughs> come from a particular part of ourselves. And uh, we'll have to be careful um, not to always listen to them. Very often, uh, they're forcing us in a way that isn't uh, the correct choice for us. But we feel like we should do it because uh, other people are doing it or because uh, uh, our idealized self uh, thinks that, that that should be what our life is like. So to be cognizant of these different voices that are going on inside of us and around us uh, in our heads and to evaluate what those voices are asking us to do. What they're telling us is most important in life 
is uh, the, the, the things that should be our goals and uh, our priorities and to weigh those things. Other voices can get in the way. We need to clear them uh, out and be, be very clear about the voice that we're listening for. A second uh, form of obstacles to finding our path in life is what I call attachments and specifically disordered or inordinate attachments, unhealthy attachments. And an unhealthy attachment is when we cling to some idea or some person or some thing, and we come to believe that our lives will not be happy or meaningful without this thing. And so we must have it. And that's a sign of a disordered attachment. Uh, we see it, for example, in the rich young ruler that comes to Jesus and, and uh, Jesus asks him uh, um, what, uh, how he's already living. He wants to live for God and ask Jesus for, uh, for advice. And Jesus says, what are you doing now? And he says, I'm following the commandments. I'm, uh, I'm uh, living our, our religious faith. And, and Jesus, uh, the gospel writer says, Jesus looked at him with love. And he said, there's one more thing. He said, if you want to really be free, uh, sell everything that you have and come and follow me. And I think it's because Jesus recognized in this man an attachment to wealth. He couldn't let go of him, the wealth that he had and of the privileges that it gave him in society, the status it gave him among his friends, um, the voice that it gave him in society, the fact that he was wealthy had a great influence on his life. And so when Jesus asked him to surrender that, uh, he wasn't able to do it. And we read in the story that he went away sad. He was attached to wealth. He had to have that wealth and all the benefits that came from it in order to be happy, in order to uh, have his life sustained. And he just couldn't imagine uh, life uh, on a simpler scale. Or take the Old Testament story of David and Bathsheba. David sees this beautiful woman uh, on the roof of her house and he decides that he must have her. Uh, even though he knows uh, and learns that she is someone else's wife. And so he calculates, uh, her husband is away at war, and he calculates a way to um, invite her to his palace and then seduces her and uh, um, has sex with her and impregnates her. And now he realizes he has even more of a problem, and so he he creates a strategy, has uh, her husband come back from the war for a few days of leave, and he's hoping that her husband uh, will have uh, intercourse with her, and then uh, when he discovers that she's pregnant, he'll assume that the child is his. Well, this doesn't happen because a soldier is a man of integrity, and he won't uh, go lie with his wife while the other soldiers are out on the battlefield. And so he insists on in, uh, staying uh, apart from his wife during this uh, short time of leave. So then David has to go even further and he instructs his, his uh, uh, leaders, his military leaders to drop back and, and leave this husband uh, exposed and so that he will be killed in battle. And this is what happens. And, and so David uh, takes advantage of this and marries uh, this beautiful woman. Now, and there, through the whole story, David is consumed with his desire for this particular woman. He has other wives. Uh, there are other women that he can uh, associate with, but he wants this one particular woman and he won't stop until he gets her. 
And so that's the that's a sign of an unhealthy possession, a kind of an attachment in which we're clinging to something with the belief that we have to have this thing in our life. So if, if you notice that there are things in your life that are extremely important to you, you might ask yourself, what would it be like to let this go? Or what would it be like not to strive after this and not to make this the most important thing? Whether it's wealth or whether it's success or popularity or uh, a good reputation, whatever it is that we covet and uh, we are willing to make sacrifices for and sometimes even uh, do um, uh, things that lack integrity in order to achieve that thing that we desire so much. So ask yourself how free you are in relationship to your possessions and in relationship to people in your life. Or are you clinging to them, trying to uh, make them the center of, of your life and, and insisting that without them you can't possibly be happy or fulfilled? Uh, so disordered attachments are one of the obstacles that get in the way of our finding God's true path for us. If I'm addicted to wealth, if I'm attached to wealth, uh, I won't consider a lesser paying job, a job that involves service but doesn't have a, a big salary because my attachment to wealth gets in the way. So those attachments can uh, influence and ruin our choices, take away our freedom. Uh, to hear God and to follow in what God is inviting us to be or to do. And then a third area that's an obstacle is the, is the place of fear and anxiety. Fear and anxiety, uh, all of us know something of what that is, but many of us are actually consumed by it and, and find that fear and anxiety uh, dominate our lives. And uh, especially when it comes to choosing a path or making a commitment or um, uh, stepping through a doorway into a specific um, way of life, uh, especially when it comes to those kind of commitments, we shy away. We're afraid of making that kind of commitment. We're afraid of the future. We can't control the future and we're afraid uh, of how this might turn out. So, for example, a, a young man making a choice for monastic life, it can be a difficult choice because it's choosing a particular community and a particular way of living for the rest of your life. And uh, we find it very difficult, especially in these days, to make that kind of commitment, an unwavering commitment to a specific path and to believe that God is calling us to that one path. The problem is, of course, that when we have various options before us, by choosing one option, we close down other options that could be available. And so some of us are afraid to step into a specific option for fear of what we might lose. So uh, those can be obstacles in, in our search for uh, what is the best way for us. A, th uh, a third thing I'd like to talk about is, uh, is how we might look at our own history to find signs of God's call at work in us. I suggested in a previous video that God's call is persistent. It comes to us again and again and again. And so maybe if we can look back on our lives, we can notice uh, some particular thing that keeps recurring, some particular call that keeps being sounded within us and uh, see this uh, pattern. And uh, that might help us to make a choice in our future. Uh, Esther Duvall is the author of a book called Seeking God, The Way of Saint Benedict. And she writes, in order to discern, we need to learn how to read our own situations, our own histories, to see the turning points, the movements of change, the unfolding of God's plan for us at each new step of the way.
in order to discern, we need to learn how to read our own histories, to see the turning points, the movements of change, the unfolding of God's plan for us at each new step of the way. So I'd like to suggest three ways that you could look back on your own history and uh, possibly find some signs, some uh, evidence, some um, indications of what God's purposes for you might be. The first uh, way that I'd like to suggest is by dividing your life into segments. So you have the segment of your childhood and then your teenage years or your adolescence and then perhaps your college years and then your 20s and, and or maybe you start dividing life up according to jobs that you've had or according to places that you've lived. But you divide your lo life into segments uh, that make sense to you. And then for each segment, uh, ask yourself, who was I at that point in my life? What was I like as a child? What things interested me? What was I good at? What was I excited about? What did I love to learn about? What did I want to do all the time? How did I spend my time? Uh, so we try to learn about ourselves in that stage of our life. And then we also ask, who was God for me in that stage of my life? How did I understand God? How did I relate to God? Did I pray? And if so, who did I think I was praying to? And uh, who was God for me? And how, how was I uh, shaping my prayers? Uh, and, uh, and how did I experience that relationship? And then maybe in your teenage years or your college years or your, your 20s, you notice a change or a shift in that relationship. So ask yourself again, in that period of life, who was I? What was I doing? What was I interested in? What mattered the most to me? And who was God for me there? What did I know about God? What did I believe about what God might want for me? So that's the first way, dividing your life in segments and looking at each segment to see who you were and who God was for you. A second way is to look back on your life at major decisions you've made. Uh, some, of, uh, some of you are probably young enough not to have made too many major decisions at this point in your life. Others of us who are a few decades along uh, might have several decisions that we've made that have been important life-changing decisions for us. A change of job or a change of location or uh, some, some kind of uh, discovery about ourselves that changed our lives. So look back on those and see if you can pinpoint the important junctures in your life where you made an important choice. And you could have gone one of two or more ways, but you chose this way. What was that choice about? What was driving it? What was inspiring it? How, why did you make that particular choice? What was it about? And what does that choice reveal about you? And what does it reveal about your image of God and your understanding of what God might want for you and for your life? So to evaluate each of those major decisions along the way and scour them looking for meaning, for indications of who am I and how is God calling me to follow Christ in the world? And then a third uh, way that you might look back on your own faith history is to look at encounters with God. Where have you had significant religious experiences, moments of encounter or epiphany, uh, moments when God was very present and real to you? Can you remember those? Or maybe a word that God spoke to you that was that really uh, hit you as being true and authentic and, and changed the way that you wanted to live. Well, look at those past experiences throughout your history of relationship with God. Where has God uh, touched your life? Where has God spoken to you in a way that redirected you? And uh, ask uh, God, what does this show about what God wants for your life and what you want? Uh, 
um, what does it reveal? So I think basically a, a big part of discernment is simply reading the inner topography of our, of our lives, the inner landscape, and saying, uh, who am I? Um, what are my gifts and talents? Uh, what is, are my likes and dislikes? Uh, what are the things that I'm best at? What are my skills and uh, natural abilities? What are my preferences? Uh, uh, what do I prefer to do? I prefer to be outdoors or indoors or working uh, before a computer or, or, or engaged in some kind of uh, manual effort. So ask yourself who you are, what, uh, what you know about yourself, and uh, to take stock of yourself. Read that inner landscape. To ask yourself also as part of that, what are my deepest desires? What are my secret hopes or dreams? What is the thing that I wish I could be if I could be anything? And uh, what does that show me about what path I might choose in life? And then to also look back uh, on our history and to say what signs are there along the way that might uh, point to a vocation, uh, a purpose for being in the world that is related to the purposes of God. In our next session, we'll look at a specific method for making choices. So when we're faced with an important choice and have a couple of options before us, how can we uh, engage God in that process of discernment? And how can we pray uh, through that choice and try to select the, the option that is most consonant with the people that we're trying to become and that God wants us to be? Thanks for joining us today.